The, the question I want to consider is, is one that we've really been talk, talking about uh, for much, much of today or, already. And it's a, in a way, it's a, it's, it's a very simple question, or it's simple to pose the question, which is what's the right level of uh, truly loss-absorbing capital that banks should be required to hold? Uh, it, in some ways, it's a, I think it's a deceptively simple question. F firstly, you have to define what you mean by right from whose point of view. And I'm going to take that from the point of view of uh, slightly pompously sounding uh, description, society as a whole. In other words, when thinking about both costs and benefits, I'm going to try and focus on overall economic costs to society as a whole. And sometimes they may diverge from cost to to banks because of externalities or, or possibly because of tax. If you change the capital requirement on a bank, that might have an impact on the amount of tax it's paid. That might increase its costs, but that tax is not lost to society as a whole. It goes to the government. There is some value on the revenue there. So a couple of reasons why, many reasons, in fact, why there may be divergence between private costs and uh, public costs. Uh, I think the, the question about the right level of capital re really is a question, as, as David, David Vineyard said this morning, of uh, tr trading things off, trading off costs and benefits. Uh, and we know where the Basel Committee ha has come to, at least for the moment, on, on trying to assess the relative magnitudes of costs and benefits and deriving a number for an acceptable level of capital. It is... Uh, in terms of truly loss-absorbing capital, which I think of uh, as common equity, it's that it should be at least 4.5%, and on top of that, you need a buffer of 25 so the answer comes out in, in ordinary circumstances to be 7% of risk-weighted assets. And the question I want to uh, try and throw a little bit of light on with a very stylized series of, 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 of assumptions and models is whether we should think of that number as being a bit too high, a lot too high, a bit too low, or dramatically lower than it should be. Is the right number not seven, but three or 40? And I want to offer some sort of illustrative calculations that, that suggest an answer to that question. I should say uh, at, at the outset that this is not in any sense a, an official view of the Bank of England. This is a view of, 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 of me. Uh, I think conceptually, we can probably agree on the nature of, of the costs and also the benefits of having banks hold rather substantially more equity that, that, than they had a few years back. The costs, I'm going to consider, come through the following pretty transparent route. It may be the case that as you increase the amount of equity capital, imagine a bank taking some debt and switching it into equity, that that will have some impact on its overall weighted average cost of funds. If it does, I'm going to assume that that simply has to be passed through to the clients of the bank. People who borrow money from the bank are going to have to pay a higher rate of interest depending on how much the weighted average cost of funding may have gone up as a result of capital being higher. That in turn will increase the hurdle rate of return on investment projects that are to some extent financed from bank lending. That will mean that the level of investment and ultimately the capital stock will be lower than it otherwise would have been. That will mean that economic activity, GDP, will also be lower. So the, the cost you pay, in, in the sort of simple framework I'm going to talk about today, the cost you pay from having higher capital requirements runs through the chain of higher average cost of funding to a bank, higher interest rate it has to charge on bank loans, higher hurdle rate, lower investment in the economy, lower capital stock, lower level of GDP. And you would have a lower level of GDP permanently year in, year out. And you take the present discounted value of all that lost GDP, uh, and that's the cost of having banks hold more equity. On the benefit side, also I think relatively conceptually straightforward what, what, what they are, it's that banks are more robust. Therefore, the probability of uh, banks in general running into a problem where people think it's running out of equity or actually running out of equity and becoming insolvent is lower. That reduces the probability of a banking crisis. A banking crisis is a very costly event. If you can reduce the probability of that happening even by a relatively small amount, if the cost of a generalized banking crisis is very high, then the benefit stemming from higher capital requirements from reducing that probability of a banking crisis is worth potentially quite a lot. Um, in the UK right now, the level of GDP is probably about 12% lower 
than you would have thought if you'd stood in the middle of 2007 before the banking crisis really became serious and had made a plausible guess as to where the level of economic activity in the UK would be right now. You'd have probably come up with a number 12%, maybe more uh, higher than the actual level of GDP. Now, maybe not all of that is a reflection of the banking crisis, which has been very serious in the UK, uh, but some substantial part may be, and some substantial part of that lost output has probably gone forever. And that's how I think about trying to get some handle on the cost of a, a banking crisis. How much is the initial hit to GDP? How much of that will turn out to be transitory so you, you get the loss back? How much of it might be um, permanent? And uh, I'll, I'll use some estimates uh, from history, from, from Rein, Reinhardt and Rogoff, whose name has also been mentioned uh, already today, to try and get a handle on that. Um, at the risk of stating something that's banal and self-evident, I don't think you can say anything particularly useful on the right kind of levels of bank capital without taking account of both costs and benefits. I'm going to start out with a few observations on, 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 on the cost side. I think there is uh, a widespread view that having banks hold more equity capital is pretty costly. You hear the phrase, we've heard it in, in some ways today already, that equity is scarce and expensive, that the capital gets tied up, it's money that's taken out of the economy, not available. Um, I think there are some reasons for being somewhat skeptical about that. And the first one is just a simple historical observation. Forgive me for being slightly parochial for a moment and showing you some numbers about the UK. I'll show some numbers about the US in just a moment. Um, this chart, forget about the blue line, this chart is a measure of the average leverage of the banking system in the UK. So this is just assets relative to uh, e e equity and, and reserve. So what I, I am labeling today true loss absorbing capital. Uh, and that leverage ratio fluctuates quite a lot from, from year to year, but it's been really on an upward trajectory for the best part of 100 years. If you take the 100 year period, 1880, to 1980, the average of this measure of leverage was probably about 12 or 13. If you then come to the eve of the banking crisis, 2006, 2007, that leverage ratio was 35, 36. So it was three times higher than had been on average normal in the 100 years, 1880 to 1980. Over that very long period, there has been no trend whatsoever, as far as I can see, in the average spread between the interest rate charged by UK banks on bank loans and a reference rate like the Bank of England uh, policy rate, bank rate, or, or the Treasury bill yield. Now, if the idea that having banks hold lots more equity was very costly and would drive up their cost of funding, you might expect that in a world in which they held a lot more equity, that's the world of 50, 60, 100 years ago, they would have to charge a bigger spread relative to, say, Bank of England, bank of England rate. Um, and there's very little evidence that that was True, I think, although I'm less confident with the, the numbers, particularly in this audience in the US, but I think that a, a, a similar story may also be true in the US. The green line here is a measure of uh, leverage of the US uh, banking system. Also, on average, on an upward trend, it's a slightly different period. It's 1920 to about 1990. Uh, I think it may, may, may go to the year 2000. That's on an upward trend. But no obvious upward, uh, sorry, no obvious downward trend as leverage increased in the spread between the average interest rate charged on, on, on business loans and a reference rate which I've taken to be the Treasury bill rate here. Now, I don't think these are killer facts. These do not prove that having more equity is, is costless. Um, but I think they, they might make one somewhat skeptical about the argument that more equity necessarily it increases dramatically the costs of funding to banks. I want to start out then with thinking perhaps a, a little bit more uh, analytically about how one might get a handle on the increase in the cost of funds to banks if equity is higher. And uh, uh, excuse me, I, I'm going to show very few e e e e equations, but 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 here's 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 one of them. Um, you might expect, and simple introductory corporate finance theory would tell you this this should be the case that as a, a, an institution. Any company holds more equity and less debt in its funding, that that will reduce the volatility of the equity. It may also make the debt somewhat safer. And that would change the required rate of return on the equity and possibly also the debt. And under perfect market assumptions, Medigliani Miller, that offset is complete. And there's a trivial, an immediate, not trivial, but immediate answer to the question what's the cost of having more equity? 
zero. There's no change in the weighted average cost of funds. Um, there are lots of reasons why Medigliani Miller might not work for any kind of company, and maybe there are even more reasons why it doesn't work for a bank. I think it's a mistake to jump to the opposite conclusion that because it probably doesn't work 100%, that therefore it works 0%. Uh, and I think one should be somewhat open-minded about whether there is an offset to the required rate of return on equity as leverage uh, changes in a bank. What I've tried to do, and I'll be very brief about this, there, there, there's more detail in, in, in a discussion paper, which I think I saw some copies of outside uh, on, on Optimal Capital uh, that myself and my co-authors put out uh, a couple of months ago. So there's a lot of detail in that. I won't speak too much about the detail. Suffice to say that what we tried to do, again, looking at UK banks, was to try to measure how their beta had moved through time as leverage changed. And it looked like, on the whole, equity beta did indeed move uh, as leverage changed in the way that you might anticipate, in the way that this simple equation would imply. Uh, and then plug that into, and I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit and won't bore you with econometric estimates, but they are the sort of underpinning of what I'm about to say. Uh, we then just assume for a moment that, that something uh, similar to the capital asset pricing model works, and this is what drives the required rate of return on equity. It looked like there was some link between higher leverage and more risky equity, higher beta, and therefore higher required rate of return. That effect was not, was not as strong as it might be under pure Medigliani-Miller, but it was neither was it zero. So we tried to use those estimates to ask the following question. Supposing you had a bank that started out with a leverage ratio of 30, not an unusual level for banks a few years ago, certainly not in the UK. And I'll make an assumption that the equity risk premium is 5, that the rate of return on debt is also 5. If you started out at a leverage of 30, based on our estimate of what the required rate of return on equity was, which turned out to be about 15, that would give you a weighted average cost of funds of the order of um, 5.3 or so. Then use the apparent slightly weaker than you might expect in the perfect market, but nonetheless not zero, link between leverage and the required rate of return that I've just talked about, and ask the question, what would happen if you left the assets exactly where they were, but you switched the funding rather substantially and reduced the leverage so that it halved? And the answer is, that on these estimates anyway, the weighted average cost of capital would indeed go up, so not Medigliani Miller world, but it wouldn't go up very dramatically, maybe of the order of 20 basis points or so. Now, I haven't said anything here about tax. It may well be that because debt tends to get favorable tra tax treatment relative to equity, there would be a further cost due to tax treatment, which I haven't allowed for here. I think that then takes you into an interesting question about whether if that's one of the main ways that funding becomes more expensive as capital requirements are higher, whether one should consider that a social cost or merely a private cost. And I'm going to show you some calculations of optimal capital that treat it either way. At one extreme, treat the extra tax revenue that the government gets as simply money wasted and down the drain. Uh, and on the other hand, treat the extra revenue as being simply a transfer from a bank to the government, which then gets recycled, and so it's not a social Cost. So this is the way of thinking about step one in the chain of this argument about how we might calibrate the optimal level of capital. Runs through higher equity, higher average cost of funding. That's then going to flow through to a higher interest rate and a higher hurdle rate for companies investing and using bank finance. There's a bit of algebraic gobbledygook here, uh, which it, it simply is one of the linking points in this chain between higher interest rate on bank loans to non-financial companies and output in the economy, and it runs through a production function, so the capital stock gets lower, and that reduces the level of GDP. Let me jump through, then, to uh, an estimate of how big these costs might be under different assumptions. I'm going to focus, really, on the first row in this table, the row that's uh, labeled change in banks' WAC, or weighted average cost of funding. Uh, and the answer to the question, if you were to have banks halve their leverage, double their capital relative to assets, how much would that affect the average cost of funding, is pretty sensitive to a bunch of stuff. Firstly, how you treat tax. Is that a true social cost, or is it just a transfer? To what extent is there some offset 
of a lower rate of return on equity as you have more capital and the equity becomes less volatile. At the low end, if you assume that that offset, if you like the Medigliani-Miller impact is pretty strong and tax isn't a real social cost, then doubling uh, equity relative to capital may add less than 10 basis points in these calculations to the average cost of funding. I think that's one end of a spectrum. Um, for what it's worth, the econometric evidence suggests that the answer might be near a 20 basis point. But if you counted tax paid by banks, extra tax paid, as a result of a reduction in the tax shield of having uh, uh, d debt, uh, then that number could can out to be higher, maybe as high as 30 or 40 basis points. But that's the range. Absolutely not trivial number, uh, but not a, an, an enormous increase on these calculations, this way of thinking about it anyway, in the cost of the average cost of funding. That then gets translated into a GDP cost, and you discount the present value of that, and you, you get pretty large numbers for the long-term present discounted value, lower GDP as a result of higher equity capital. Not small numbers. But they have to be weighed up against the potential benefits of there being a lower probability of a generalized banking crisis. And in order to get a handle on that part of the calculation, the benefit side, we've talked about the cost side, the benefit side of banks having more equity, uh, we really need to make uh, some fundamental assumptions about how you reduce the probability of banks in general running into a major problem as a result of them having more equity. And that's really a question, I think, about how what are the scale of shocks that hit the value of bank assets that the equity is there to protect them against uh, and prevent them becoming insolvent? Uh, I think that is a profoundly difficult question. Um, let me tell you how I've gone about trying to get some handle on that. And it, it, it's the following assumption. I'm going to think about fundamental risks to the assets of banks. Most assets of banks, one way or another, are loans to uh, households or, 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 or other corporations. The ability of the private sector to pay interest on its bank debt, you'd expect to be pretty sensitively affected by the average level of incomes in the private sector. The average levels of incomes in the private sector is strongly correlated with what's happened to GDP. And therefore, I'm going to assume that to get a handle on the volatility, the kind of shocks that affect the value of bank assets, you can learn a lot from looking at the volatility of GDP. And I don't mean the volatility of GDP just over the last 10 or 15 years. I mean looking at a long run of history from a large range of countries to try and assess what's the probability of really serious bad events that might come along only once every 50, 100, or even 200 years. So to cut a long story short, we uh, try to estimate a, a model of the volatility or the probability distribution that GDP might follow by looking at a whole range of countries over almost 200 years, so it's kind of 5,000 observations on the annual change in GDP. And most of the time, GDP seems to follow uh, a nice, well-behaved normal distribution. But a normal distribution is a very bad description to try and get a handle on what's the probability of very substantial shocks that hit economies. And we've um, used a, a model developed a little while ago by Robert Barrow to try and get a handle on what's the chances of rare but very serious events. I won't bore you with too much with the, the, the technical details, except to say that the model that we ended up estimating um, allows for rare events that, if they happen, have a big negative impact on GDP, uh, and slightly less rare events that could be either good or bad. But what it generates is a probability distribution that's absolutely not normal. There are bad things that happen with dramatically higher probabilities than a normal distribution would give you. Uh, and a normal distribution does a very bad job of fitting history. And the distribution we've ended up with um, does a moderately good job of, of fitting not just the central part of the probability distribution, but the tails. Key assumption we make, key assumption we make is that there is a link between these fundamental shocks that hit economies and affect incomes in the private sector and the value of assets of banks. Specifically, we make the assumption that if a bad event occurs and, say, reduces the level of GDP by 3% in one year, which is a pretty bad outcome, uh, that that will reduce the value of risk-weighted assets by the same percentage. So imagine a bank that has risk-weighted assets that are maybe 
a third of total assets, not, not unusual for many banks, certainly in Europe. So it's risk-weighted assets, say, are a third of its total assets. We get a bad event, GDP falls by 3%, risk-weighted assets fall by 3%, total assets fall by 1%. So it ends up with assets, if, it, if they were 100 at the beginning of the year, very bad event, GDP falls 3%. At the end of the year, the assets are worth 99. I don't think that that is an excessively pessimistic assumption about the scale of risks that over the long run might be hitting the value of bank assets. Anyway, it's what we assume. Final part of the chain of events that will lead us to an estimate of the benefits of having banks more equity is what happens if banks don't have enough equity to withstand these shocks that come along and hit the value of their assets? So supposing risk-weighted assets go down by 6% and their equity capital is 5.99, I'm going to take that as an instance where there is a major banking problem. And if that happens in general to banks, and remember we've talked about risks as being generalized risks that hit economies. So these are risks that don't hit individual banks. If there's, a, if there's a macro risk that hits the whole economy, that's likely to hit most banks. If that happens and there isn't enough equity around um, and, 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 and banks uh, face insolvency, that's what I'll define as a banking crisis. And if that happens, it has a very negative effect on GDP. Um, Reinhardt and Rogoff work suggests that if there is a real banking crisis, that the level of GDP historically, when that has happened, uh, may fall by as much as 10%. A substantial part of it may be a permanent hit. I'm going to assume that the 10% number is right. If there is a generalized banking crisis, the hit to the value of assets is more than the value of equity. That, that takes 10% off GDP in the first instance. Only 25% of that is a permanent hit. So you get 75% of that hit back within a few years. And again, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that that is an excessively pessimistic view on the scale of the damage done by a generalized banking crisis. Certainly, again, to be slightly parochial about the UK, uh, those numbers would look optimistic relative to what's happened in the UK over the last three years rather than pessimistic. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll wind up in just a minute because I'm getting close to the sort of bottom line from these calculations. We can now put the bits of this calculation together we have a way of working out how much funding costs go up if you ask for more equity, what that does to investment in the economy, the capital stock, and GDP. That's the cost side. Benefit side, you have more equity capital, makes the probability of bank insolvencies slightly lower. That has a benefit because when bank insolvencies happen, it's very damaging. Ask the question, what level of capital maximizes uh, benefits over costs? So on the horizontal axis here, we measure different levels of the capital ratio, and I think of this as capital relative to risk-weighted assets. Uh, and think of the vertical axis as just a measure of n n the thing you're trying to maximize, net benefits. Three lines rather than one, because I'll, I'll make different assumptions about how costly is it to have banks hold more capital. The most pessimistic assumption is there's no Medigliani Miller offset and all the taxes that banks might have to pay extra because they've got less debt, is, is, it goes to the government, but the government simply wastes it. The least pessimistic assumption, therefore the highest line on net benefits, assumes that there is a substantial Medigliani-Miller type offset. You have more equity, you require rate of return goes down a bit, and that any extra tax going for the government is, is, is not lost to the economy. What does this picture say about what the right number might therefore be for capital relative to risk-weighted assets? Well, it's whatever number maximizes the height of this line. Uh, and that number, under most of these cases, is, is around about 17 to 20%, depending on what assumptions you make about, about tax and Medigliani-Miller type stuff. Uh, I think one of the key characteristics of this picture is it slopes very sharply to the left of 16, 17, 18%, but it's pretty flat to the right. And if, if, if it turns out that that is a reflection of the world, and there's an awful lot of assumptions gone into this, and this is a kind of very simplistic calculation in some ways, but if that is a reflection of reality, what that says is that the cost of having banks hold too little equity may be rather substantial, but the cost of having them hold, quote, too much relative to the level that gets you to the highest point on this line are not too dramatic because the line's flat to the right 
of 18 to 20 percent, but it's, sh it's, it's sharply sloping downwards to the left. Let me just show you uh, actual, some actual numbers that come out of this. Um, if it's the case that you think banking crises have some permanent effect on GDP, that 10% initial shock to GDP, you only get 75% of that back, and you permanently lost from the level of GDP 25% of that hit, 2.5% of GDP, then you get to the numbers on the left-hand uh, side. Somewhere between 18 and 20% capital relative to risk-weighted assets. You get lower numbers if you think the shock that hits GDP when there is a banking crisis doesn't have a permanent impact. 16, 17, 18%. Uh, whichever way you look at it, uh, these numbers look rather substantially higher uh, than the figures that look like they're coming out of a ball three. So I think, um, and maybe I'll finish on, th on this point since my time has run out, I think my, my, my interpretation of this is that ball three very much goes in the right direction because the ball three numbers are going to be much closer to these kind of figures than ball two or ball one. Uh, but they're probably still on the low side, maybe even half as much as these calculations suggest might, might be the right number. I think the implication of that, if you, if you believe there's something in that, is that watering down ball three would be a very bad idea, uh, and that maybe when we get to the next iteration on this uh, ball four, ball five, uh, it would be desirable that we headed in the direction of higher capital requirements relative to risk-weighted assets. I strongly suspect I am in a small minority in this, in this room in saying that, um, and that might be a good place to, for me to stop. <laughs> but, but very happy to um, on, on, on answer questions. I don't mind abusive questions. Hi, Chris Mazingo with McKinsey. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Very, very interesting. Um, two questions first, I, I'm, and then I follow up. The first one is, if you could talk about the sample of countries and the time period that you're you're looking at. Okay, um, the sample is thirty odd countries. Uh, for the countries where you get the longest run of data, it goes back to eighteen twenty or so and goes through to about two thousand and eight. Uh, the, average, the average period for which we've got data on these countries is something like 130, 140 years. They are predominantly countries that we now consider as rich developed economies. Uh, some of the big events historically that drive the very big negative outcomes are wars, natural disasters. Uh, in some sense, I've tried to take out the impact of those things on the grounds that it doesn't seem the most desirable strategy to have such a high level of bank capital that if there is a terrible natural disaster that wipes out 50% of the economy, the banks can still survive. Because in that, in that stage of the world, you've got more serious things to worry about than the, the banking system has a problem. So um, I, I, I said that when I fitted the probability distributions to try to fit the whole sample, you need to assume that there's a small chance of super negative shocks. I've taken those super negative shocks out in doing this calculation as to what the optimal capital is on the grounds that you don't want capital requirements to try and make banks robust to these extraordinarily bad events. Yeah. So I, I think the follow that partly gets at the question. I, I think the follow up question is, you know, there, there's one chart where there's a 1.2% probability of a loss in GDP in one year of greater than 15%. Yeah, um, that's something that I've, I actually haven't ever seen happening in the United States, even in the Great Depression, and in a, in a single year's time. And you know, it, it seems like that's something that might be might have happened in I don't know the Weimar Republic or the rise of the Third Reich or mm, the Bolshevik absolutely. Revolution or some sort of, of thing. Yeah. But I, I just I mean I mean if you look at the stylized facts of economic history, yeah. as governments have become a bigger part of the economy, as uh, you know as as there's become you know work such as John Maynard Keynes and Milton Friedman about macroeconomic management, you know, the volatility of the cycle has dampened substantially. And I, I'm just wondering if, if we're not sort of capitalizing banks to a level that was appropriate for the 18th or 19th century rather than a modern macroeconomic world. 
I mean, I, I take your point about you know Weimar Germany and you know world wars. They're devastatingly bad. Those, those are the events that, if they happen, knock you know the thirty odd percent of GDP. I, I have great sympathy with what you say. I, that's why I've taken them out of this calculation. There, there, there are some tables in, in the longer version of the paper that say, supposing, supposing you want to have banks that can even withstand those things, not surprisingly, the required amount of capital goes up relative to these numbers. That's why I want to focus on, the, on this, this table, which ignores the most extreme bad events. Have you looked at actual bank capital levels going back to the 19th century? My understanding is that I've seen some graphs that said beginning like maybe mid 19th century in the US, capital ratios tended to be more like 40, 50%. And then there's been a very long term secular change of that becoming lower and lower, um, particularly, I guess, after deposit insurance was introduced. Uh, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Let me, I'm trying rapidly to go. Okay, Anna's going to answer your question. Uh, okay. My, my, my first couple of graphs kind of could confirm pretty, pretty much what you've said. I mean, certainly for the UK, I mean, that, that, that's what leverage used to look like for, for, for UK banks. In the 19th century, um, you know, it was five or six. So these were banks that had 20, 25% uh, capital. I, I, I think the same is similar for the US, but, I, but I'll leave, the, I, and I've got good, some good numbers on that. But I think you're right. And I guess my point, my point for raising that was that didn't stop rapid growth, industrialization, you know, that wasn't devastating to the financing of the industrialization of, of the US or, or, or the UK. Hi. Um, a couple of questions, I guess. One, could do you have a kind of a ballpark sense of, you know, what this does to the probability of a banking crisis? Does it go from one in a 25 year to one in 50, you know, something like that? And I guess, Secondly, and I hesitate to say this as a banker, but you know, many of us I think would say that you know, there's an endogenous element to these crises, that they're not simply are the banks sort of sufficiently prepared for the vicissitudes of this external set of shocks that comes at them, but that they themselves respond to incentives and in some ways, you know, in God forbid, you know, bring them on through the, their mistakes from time to time. So how, how do you think about that issue and whether the results are robust to that kind of behavior? And especially, I mean, the more academic style would be the Gale paper, which talks about, you know, the bank's, you know, risk incentives and, and the level of the riskiness of the assets that they will hold, you know, in response to the regimes that they're under. Mm. Um, very, very good questions. I'll do my best. Uh, on, the, on the first question, by how much do you reduce the chances of bank insolvency if you got banks to a position where they had eight, 17, 18% of capital relative risk rate assets? I think the answer to that is, I, I should do the calculation. I, I can give you the exact answer. I think, I think the answer would be you reduce the probabilities of banking crisis to very low levels. And the reason why it turns out in, in this simple framework that that's the right answer is that if a generalized banking crisis happens, it is incredibly costly. And that's why the cost-benefit analysis says, make sure there's enough equity capital in place to make that a very, very low probability event. Now, that, would, that wouldn't be the answer if it turned out that ratcheting up the amount of equity capital relative to risk-weighted assets actually increased the cost of uh, bank funding so substantially that you did substantial damage year in, year out to the amount of investment because you've just made borrowing money from banks very, very expensive. So that's, that's I think that's tech, you know, just the mechanics of the, of, of the argument. That's why you get the answer, have lots of equity capital relative to risk-weighted assets. Now, I, I, I should have said something a little bit more about the definition of a banking crisis. I think, I think I've used a relatively conservative, def if conservative is the right word. It, well, here's what I've done. I've assumed that you've got a banking crisis when you've completely wiped out the equity. So as long as something happens uh, that leaves you with $1 of equity, 
everything's okay. So that's, that's uh, an assumption which I think in many, in many ways underestimates how much protection against insolvency you've got by having capital levels. Because as long as you've got enough there to get you to the end of the day, you're okay. Whereas I suspect in reality, if you had a shock that took equity capital down to very low levels, people who could get their money out from you, you know, would, would do so because you're then a substantially weakened animal. So I've taken a pretty conservative definition of what, what it is that's going to hit a banking crisis. What it is to, to get a banking crisis. David, almost a, a follow-on question there. Your answer uh, piqued a, an interest. Um, if, in fact, the way that graph works is by driving the cost of financial or the likelihood of financial crises down to very low levels, how do you explain the issue that we seem to have had financial crises through whole lots of different financial models, uh, bank heavy, non-bank heavy over time, uh, that they seem to persist? Um, and it's, there's a related question here. If you push bank equity up to a high level, do you end up with much more of a shadow banking system where, yes, you may not get a, a bank crisis, but you could still get a financial crisis? Yeah. Um, on, 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 let me take the, sec the second bit first. I mean, the, the shadow system. If, if, if you put these kind of capital requirements in place, would you just shift the problem somewhere else that it will, will go somewhere else? I think the question is, I mean, you, 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 you may well generate more business in, in something that's not called a bank. Um, now, as long as the thing that you push the activity to that's not called a bank itself is much less likely to cause generalized financial instability, I mean, that's okay. That's kind of what you, what, what you want to do. Obviously, the problem is if you push activity to something else that looks like it's not a bank and is independent of something that is a bank, but actually when push comes to shove, it turns out that it comes back into the banking system, um, clearly that's, that's, not the, that's not what you want to happen. And, and in, in some sense, I guess what you want is that your risk weights, or, or more generally, your assessment of the risk of a bank absolutely does reflect the, the, the knock-on effect of something that appears to be outside the banking system actually coming back and biting, bite, biting the bank. Um, I, I, I suspect Anat's going to have something to, to say about this, um, and many of you will see Anat's op-ed in the Financial Times this morning, which is kind of partly about, about, about this question, I think. Jacob Goldfield at Stanford. Hello. Um, so your, the 18% result, I, I guess, is a function of the accounting and regulatory regime. Uh, how would the 18% be different if uh, losses were recognized as they occurred? The 18% the, the number, I think, I think the, cru the, crucial, the crucial assumption, I mean, as well as the stuff about cost of capital and all that, I think the crucial assumption and probably the weakest part of this analysis, to be honest with you, is that if you've got a shock that hits incomes in the private sector, it's a GDP shock, how does that translate into a loss in the value of bank assets? And I've simply taken, in some sense, a, a rather arbitrary assumption that the answer is one for one on risk-weighted assets. So if the shock is uh, not this, the shock we, have, we had yeah. was... Uh, Many shocks, very slow. It wasn't real. It wasn't one sharp shock. Yeah. Uh, so there was plenty of time if the banks had recognized their losses to raise equity, and so that affects R yes, how much equity does. you need. So yeah. assume the eighteen percent is right for the current regime of, uh, yeah. you know, accounting and regulatory forbearance. Right. What do you think it would be if banks recognized their losses they happened and raised equity or sold? Yeah. Assets? I mean, that, so that is a very good question. I, I've assumed that it's a stark assumption that if a bad thing happens, it happens suddenly out of the blue and bang, it immediately and instantly hits the true value of your assets and that's widely perceived and everything happens, in a sense, at a point in time. If, if the world is more like the following, then you could probably have banks get away with less equity capital. If what happens is a bad thing happens, uh, and maybe it doesn't happen at a particular point in time, maybe it's just a series of bad things that happen over the course of six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years. And during the course of that happening, banks do indeed recapitalize themselves in real time. Then, of course, you could get away with starting with a lower than an 18% Our number. Our current accounting and regulatory regime have transformed a series of shocks uh, into as if one shock because it created discontinuity in terms of equity raising because they didn't have to go raise equity because they hid their losses. So trying to get, that's the key. I'm trying to figure out whether that would substitute for higher equity. 
I, I, I think the answer is yes. 